tonight. Amen. Amen. You know, we've been uh, talking about the glory for the last couple of nights, and I'm going to stay right there, and actually we're going to go in a little deeper tonight in that. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, won't you ever learn how to get there? You always know how to be there. The problem is a lot of times we just don't know how to get there. We want to get there, but we just don't know how. We allow, because see, when in order to get into the glory of God, you have to lay everything down. You know, you, you, you can't take your stuff into the glory. You just can't. You know, a lot of times, you know, people want to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to take this sickness away from me. Lord, I need you to take this disease away from me. And the Lord, will, he, right out front, he'll tell you, I didn't give it to you. So why are you coming to me and trying to give something to me that don't belong to me? He said, I took care of that 2,000 years ago. What you need to be doing is putting it, giving it back to hell where it came from. You know, knowledge is, is a wonderful thing. You know, the, the Word of God says that we were destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so many times, it's going to be the greater one that is in you. So that's why Jesus always said, and you know, for me to say this a couple of times this week, Jesus said, I only say what my Father tells me to say, and I only do what my Father tells me to do. And the reason that I do that, because he only responds to his words. Ha. Come on now. I said, he only responds to his words. As a matter of fact, in the book of Jude, it says that he's coming back to judge. He's coming back to judge who? Those who are murmuring and complaining. In other words, those that speak, did not speak, that do not speak his language, that speak the language of hell and not the language of heaven. Because you understand, murmuring and complaining is the language of hell. It's the language of the flesh, so if it's a part of the flesh, then it's a part of the hell. And so when we understand that, then we don't go to God crying and, and hoping. We go to God knowing. You know, there's nothing wrong with tears. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we all had them. You know, we're hurting and things like that. But we don't go, you know, trying to fleece God or we're trying to beg God. You don't need to beg God. It'd be like my, my daughter begging me uh, for food. When, I, you know, her, when she was little, of course, she still stays with me. I still take care of her. You know, she's, you know, she's with me till Jesus comes. Come on, Amen. And so she is not concerned, and she's 35 years old. Man, good night. That didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. She's 35 years old, and she, even now at 35 years old, she is not concerned whether she's going to have food on the table. She's not concerned about whether her bills are going to be paid because she knows Daddy has her back. Now, come on now. She's 35 years old. It's not that she's dependent on me. It's that because I, she's chose to be a part of my life and she travels with us full time, and that's the life she chose to live because that's the life she chose to live. She reaps the benefits. So if we choose to live the life of God, come on now, if we choose to live the life of God, then we get to choose to enjoy the benefits. Amen? Amen? So we shouldn't be concerned and we shouldn't be worried. No matter what it looks like in the natural, that's really not what it is. Remember, I've been telling you all week, the enemy comes to alter the reality of truth, you know? And so we can't allow the, our, the truth to be altered by the enemy or by the voice. And if we can learn to sh st shut our ears down to that voice that is speaking to us and telling us that we're nobody, that we're no good, that we're never going to have nothing, we're never going to be nothing, you know, if you think that this is real, you're wrong, it's not real, it's just a fairy tale, then he's going to continue to lie to you. If you listen to a lie long enough, it becomes truth in your heart. Matter of fact, in um, World War II, uh, during, Hitler's, uh, during Hitler's reign, um, his um, minister of um, dealing with propaganda, his minister of propaganda and Goebbels, uh, one of the things that Hitler told him, he says, you need to get this lie big enough and you need to tell it more than enough so that people will begin to believe it. Huh? And so you know history. I mean, it was nothing but lies coming out of Germany. And the Germany's people, they were lied to and they were deceived all because they believed in a man and the voice that came from across the radio. They never even, they didn't get to see him very much. They just heard a voice. We don't see the enemy, but we sure do hear his voice. 
And so if you listen to the enemy long enough, you listen to Satan long enough, or the voice of Satan long enough, telling you that you're sick, telling you that you're defeated, telling you that you got this problem and that problem with your family and all this, if you listen to it long enough, guess what? The reality of truth is altered, then that which is not real becomes real. Amen? And so if we allow our, the, the truth to be altered, guess what? It keeps us out of the glory. And so therefore, because we, we can't enter into his gates if we're not in thanksgiving, and we can't enter into his courts unless we're praising. Well, you can't praise and complain at the same time. Amen. Huh? Amen. Come on. So we have to, you know, we have to enter into that being thankful. In all things, we need to be thankful because we know that God's got this. Huh? Come on now. You know, my daughter, if she gets, if she gets something in the mail that's, that's not, wasn't, she prepared for the only thing she can do is what the best thing that she can do is bring it to me. That would be her first, that would be her best choice. May not be her first choice sometimes, but it would be her best choice. Come on now. And she'll tell you, she sometimes she's tried to do things on her own. It didn't turn out very well. Huh? Come on now. Because she's chosen to live this life. So when she chooses to come to daddy first, and said, Daddy, I got this situation. Well, she's going to trust me that I've got enough wisdom and knowledge and also substance. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, come on now. That I can take care of this situation one way or another. It can be taken care of. Well, I can't compare to this Heavenly Father. Uh, come on. So why are you sitting there and trying to figure this thing out on your own? You're trying to do these things on your own and trying to figure out life on your own, trying to get through these things on your own. When you've got a daddy who loves you, said, just bring it to me. Huh? He said, just bring it to me. If you'll bring it to me, I'll take care of it so that you don't have to be concerned and so you don't have to worry because you can't take concern and worry into the glory. All these things have got to be shredded off of us. If we want to experience the glory, then we got to let this stuff go away from us and off of us. And the only thing left remaining is the life of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's why Paul said in Romans chapter 8, in verse 37 and 38, he said, in all these things, we are more than what? More than conquerors. Not just conquerors, but we're more than that. Amen. You understand? We're not just conquerors. We're actually taking hold and possessing everything, not just some of the things. When he's talking about conquerors, we're possessing and taking hold of everything that God has. Amen. Come on, we're not just needing a piece of God. I want all of God. I'm just sorry I'm greedy that way. <laughs> I want everything he has. If I don't want, listen to me, I don't want Jesus to think that he died in vain on my behalf. Let me say that again. I said, I do not want Jesus to think on my behalf that he died in vain. Because the moment I start questioning him, the moment I start worrying, the moment I start getting concerned about all these things and allowing the cares of the world to weigh me down, actually what I'm doing is slapping Jesus in the face and telling him what you did was in vain because I don't trust what you did 2,000 years ago. That's what happens when we start getting into these areas and allowing these cares of the world to overwhelm us and to overtake us. I'm not saying that sickness and disease is not real. I'm not saying that depression is not real, but they don't have to stay. You understand? She gets a bill in the mail. That bill's real, but it don't have to stay in her hands. Oh, come on now. She's got a decision to make. She's got a choice to make. She can hold on to that situation, or she can go and bring it to me. Well, if the enemy comes and brings you something that you're not expecting, then you got a choice to make. Either you can hold on to it and try to figure out how to get through it yourself, or you can go to Daddy God and say, Daddy God, you got mail. <laughs> huh? So if you get a bad report from the, from the daughter, you take that report and say, here, Daddy. Huh? You, <laughs> this is yours. You, de- you deal with this. You take care of this. Come on. And so what that does, it takes all the pressure off you. See, the enemy is trying to pressure you because he knows if he can pressure you, you won't make godly decisions. Oh, man. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. And so if we could just really learn how to to lay in all these things, we have to understand that, first of all, that we are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors. Through Christ Jesus. Amen? And so when we understand this, because that he loved us, through him that he loved us, understanding how much he loves you, he loves you unconditionally. Amen? Amen. Do you know what unconditionally means? 
Think about it. There's nothing that you can say or do that's going to stop him from loving you. I didn't say he's going to stop the blessings. I didn't say it's going to stop the miracle signs and wonders. I said it's not going to stop him from loving you. You understand? God never stops a miracle. God never stops a wonder. And he never stops a sign. We do. Because of what we say and because of what we do. Huh? Because your first response, and you've heard me say this, those that have been coming all these years when I'm here, your first response is always going to determine what happens next in your life. So if you choose, when you get under attack, what's going to be your first response? Are you going to get into complaint? Oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Then you just slap Jesus in the face. Then he just died in vain on your behalf. But you say, God, I thank you that I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I thank you that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Lord, I thank you that you always, always, always cause me to triumph over every situation. Well, how many times is always? Huh? Well, if that's what the word says, then how come we're not operating in this? Because Jesus told the disciples, he said, I'm, leave, I'm leaving a comforter with you, which is the Holy Spirit. He said, greater things than you would do. In other words, he said, you're going to operate through this and with this, come on, you're going to operate with this more than anybody else, even more than what I, how I operated it in. That's saying a lot. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who walked on water. We're talking about Jesus who healed the blind, who, come on, made the lame walk, who raised the dead. Huh? Come on now, we're, we're talking about that Jesus, and Jesus is actually telling the disciples right now, he said, you are actually have the, the ability, you have the ability to operate in this greater measure than what I did. When's the last time you walked on water? Huh? Well, say, aren't you taking it out of context? No, I'm taking it exactly what the word says. God said, Jesus said, that we will do greater things. Come on. Well, if that's going to happen, then there's some things that we must do. There's some things we got to understand. And I found out a long time ago, the way to operate through this and in this word is in the glory. I found out we can't operate in this in the flesh. Huh? We can't operate in this flesh because the flesh is going to deceive you. The flesh is going to lie to you. You know your body will lie to you? Huh? My body lies to me all the time. Uh, come on. I mean, I was an athlete. I, I played ball for years and years and years and caught uh, 13 years um, baseball, and, and I've had to have both my knees totally reconstructed and new ligaments and tendons and all put in and everything. And uh, it just wasn't just recently. Um, I get up and start walking, and all of a sudden, my left leg, my knee decided it don't want to operate. And there's so much pain, and I know what it is because the nerve has gotten attached because that screw sometimes moves, and it grabs a hold of a nerve. And so I sit there and I said, no, devil, we're not going there. We're just not. And so I, I, I remember one time I was walking because I like to walk three miles a day. When I can, I don't do it in the cold. So Nebraska is kind of out of the question. <laughs> you know, tomorrow maybe, but afternoon, but not until then. Um, I'm walking and I'm about a mile, a little over a mile, almost a mile and a half from my house. And then my knee goes to the point where it is excruciating pain. Well, at this moment, I can't move. So I actually have to call my wife and said, find me. Because we all have, you know, our phones, we can find it. We know where each other are all the time, 24-7, so they can find me. I said, find me <laughs> and come get me. Because where you at? I said, all I know is I'm on this road, but find me. You got my, you know where I'm at located, come find me. And so she came and she found me. She picked me up and, I, and took me back home. Well, then I got frustrated because I couldn't do that. So I had to go in. I started rubbing everything. You know what I did later on that afternoon? I got right back out of the house, and I walked again. Huh? I had no problem this time. I said I have a problem this time because I wasn't going to let the devil defeat me. I'm not going to let my body understand, tell me how I'm going to operate. I tell my body how it's going to operate. You understand? Because I'm coming from the voice of the word. I'm coming from the voice of the father. I'm not coming from the voice of the flesh. If I come from the voice of the flesh, then guess what? I'm not going to be here tomorrow morning because I'm going to be in too much pain. 
Get mighty quiet in this full gospel church. And the reason why I can operate that is because of verse 38, for I am totally persuaded. Huh? For I am totally persuaded that, that I have, in other words, I have put myself in a position. Come on, I have put myself in a position of authority. You understand? When I'm persuaded, that means I am putting myself in position that I'm actually in control. Come on, how many want to be in control? Come on, tell the truth. Don't, don't lie. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Come on, let's tell the truth. You know good and well you like to be in control. You don't like to be a, a doorstep. You don't like people, that, you know, to, to control you. I would hope you wouldn't. Huh? And so I, if, because I'm going, I've, I've, I've made a decision that I'm going to position myself in a place of authority. So that when in a place of authority means this, what I say goes. Let me try this side over here. <laughs> huh? I say when I put myself in this position, you understand, I'm choosing to put myself in a position of authority. And so because I'm in position of authority, that means my voice carries weight. Huh? Come on now. That, they, that, that the demons have to obey my voice. My angels have to obey my voice. Huh? Come on now. And so when I release my angels to go and take care of business, they have no choice, but they have to take care of business because I'm not coming from the flesh side. I'm not coming from a defeated, come on, I'm coming from a, a, a not a victim mentality, but I'm coming from a victory mentality. Amen. So I don't position myself as a victim. I position myself as a victor. You understand? And so when we understand this, I am persuaded, that means that neither death, nor, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other, any other creature, I don't care what it is, who it is, is going to separate me from not just the love of God, but the knowledge of God. Because if I have knowledge of who he is, then I find out who I am. Because I can't know, I don't, I, there's no way I'm going to know who I am unless I know who he is. And once I understand and start finding out who he is, I find out more about myself, Amen. my true self. I'm not talking about my flesh self. I'm talking about my true self, my spirit man, the Christ side of me. Feel Christ, not feel privet. Because there's two different people living here, you understand. My wife will tell you which side is operating. <laughs> I prefer to operate all the time as Phil Christ, but I don't always operate that way. Huh? Now I know all y'all operate. In... <laughs> don't look at me like that. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, because we listen. We're all we all have the opportunity. Come on, to operate from the flesh side. All right? We all have the opportunity to operate from the flesh side. We just got to choose not to operate from that. So it's just like a decision, okay, when a situation arises, okay, which side is going to respond? Who's going to respond here? Is Phil Privet going to respond or is Phil Christ going to respond? Because if Phil Privet responds, then Phil Privet's going to get what Phil Privet has. And you don't understand, Phil Privet's limited, but Phil Christ ain't. Oh, come on now. Huh? I said, feel Christ's name. So if feel Christ is unlimited, then it would behoove me. Come on now. I mean, the smart decision here, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure this out, that I should operate and respond from the feel Christ side. Because if I operate from the feel Christ side, then no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And that means that every place my feet tread becomes my territory. And so if I'm standing right here, I have control of this environment right here. You understand? If it ain't going right, then I can change the environment. Just like if I go to a thermostat, and if I don't like the temperature of the house, all I got to do is change the thermostat. Huh? It don't take rocket scientists. Now, some of these thermostats it may, but uh, your normal <laughs> thermostat, I have been in a house like, how in the world? The first time, we were in Houston, and they got this new high, dad, high gadget, whatever thing, thermostat, and I'm sitting here trying to figure out this thing, and and it's going off different things, and I know I set a temperature at a certain thing, and then in the middle of the night, I'm sweating, it's so hot, and I didn't know they had it pre-programmed, so whatever I programmed it at a certain time, it went back. And then I had to go back to it again, it was pre-programmed. A few hours later, it goes back again. I was like, this is getting ridiculous. So, I had, so the next day, I talked to the you know, to pastor there, I said, you know, what's the deal with the thermostat? He goes, oh, I forgot to take it off auto. 
for you. He said, because nobody's, you know, we, because when we go there and do the crusades, we had the whole upstairs, which is, um, you know, a great place. And uh, he said, so nobody hardly ever goes up there. So we just set the temperature at minimum just to keep stuff either from freezing or being too hot. Depends on the, you know, the time of season. And I said, well, I appreciate it because I was trying to control it. I put it where I wanted it, but yet it would go back. Kind of sounds like, huh? You, you start outright, and you put it where you want it, but then the enemy will come in because he already has preset things against you. Oh, come on now. And so you got to go back. Well, what you need to do is just take it off auto, and you take control. Amen. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. Come on now, because he already, th- he already knows your, your flesh side. See, the enemy knows Phil Privet very well. He knows what cranks Phil Privet's tractor. Huh? Don't look at me. You're in Nebraska. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not in the city somewhere. I mean, I'm in Nebraska. Huh? Come on. I'm not in New York City somewhere. Don't nobody know what a cow looks like. All right? (laughs) All right? So, in other words, you understand, he knows how to get my flesh started. All right? (laughs) You know, and because he knows how to get my flesh started, come on now then he will use those things. He'll use that key to start that engine, all right? But if I take the key away from him, I'm so glad she's enjoying this. (laughs) Oh, she's laughing. Are you all right? Huh? So if I can keep him from getting the key, if I keep stop getting him the key, then he can't crank the tractor. Huh? Come on now, let's just be real. I'm trying to make this simplified to you so you can understand. This is, this is what the word is talking about. And when I'm, am, when I'm fully persuaded, I means I am positioning myself, you understand, that I'm actually taking the key to my life away from him. Huh? And I'm taking the keys. You know, it's just like when my daughters were young and, you know, I, I mean, I was excited when they got, their mother was more excited than I was because she could send them to the store. She could, do, you know, run around and all this. And, of course, Tiffany was the oldest, and she got to, to drive first. And so we had, she had two other siblings, and so she could take care of running them where they needed to go and all that. We were excited about her. What we hated is when we had to take the keys away from her. Huh? Come on now. So if she did something that was not going against my rules, you know, she broke the rules of the house or something like that, then the first thing I would do, I, I knew, I mean, I didn't have to sit there. I could just take the keys because that's the worst thing in the world. Now she's grounded at my house, and she has to be with me. Huh? But the, part, uh, the bad part is, is that my wife didn't like that idea because that puts her, the keys in her hands, and now she's got to do the running around. She goes, you're not just punishing her. Now you're punishing me. Huh? So you understand, you're punished. When the enemy comes to punish you, it just don't affect. Oh, come on now. Huh? It just don't affect you. And so if you get messed up and you come on, if you mess up, then your spouse will have to reap the benefits of it sometimes also because of the attitudes and everything else until you get it right and you take back the keys and take back the authority that God has given you. Come on, it just don't affect you. It affects everyone else around you. Glory to God. So I made a choice. I'm going to be persuaded because, see, my number one goal is to get and stay in the glory. Huh? Because, see, if I can learn how to control these things and put these things under and allow Phil Christ to be in control, then actually, I can actually enter into the glory gates. Go with me to Genesis. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2 in verse 15. And we're talking about we're talking about the glory. So in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 15 through 17, I want to read it from the message translation because I like the way this says it. It's so much more understandable than the these and the thous. God took the man and he set him down in the Garden of Eden to work the ground and to keep it. To keep it how? In order. Everybody say in order. order. Now, it's interesting because we don't really think about this, that when God created man, he created man to keep order on the earth. Huh? 
So if there's chaos around you, then it's your fault. Huh? Because you can change the chaos. You have control. Wherever, remember? Every place you'll feature. Remember when Moses told Joshua, he said, as I, when, uh, I mean, when God told Joshua about Moses when Moses died, he said, as I was with you, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you, that every place your feet tread will become your territory. In other words, he said, I'm putting you in authority uh, to, that every place your feet tread, you get to control the environment. In other words, I'm putting you, to, I'm putting you in authority to keep order. And so when he created Adam, when he put Adam here on this earth, because you understand, there was chaos on the earth before God created, I mean, when God created the heavens and the earth, and then when Satan got kicked out of heaven, then chaos showed up. And then Jesus don't like chaos in anything that he creates, so he decided he's going to create mankind to take over, to take control, to take back and put things right. Oh. Well, he said, well, couldn't Jesus or God put it back? He created the earth for mankind. And so he put us here, and so he created Adam, and he created us, Adam and Eve, and then he created mankind. And so he put Adam and Eve in the garden. He told Adam, he said, I'm placing you here, not just to watch over it, to keep an eye on things. He said, but if anything's out of order, it is up to you to put it back in order. Because you understand, he says, when he placed him, he says, now I understand, I'm placing you here, and you're not doing this in your own strength, in your own authority. You're, you are carrying the glory. Because yeah. huh? you remember, Adam and Eve were naked. They didn't know they were naked because they were covered with the glory. Remember I told you yesterday, I said, you can't, well, the, the glory should, can be so thick that you can't see through it. So if the enemy's coming against you, if you learn to check out in the glory, if you learn to check out in the glory, then he can't find you. So when Adam was walking around and Eve was walking around, it's not that they were just naked as what you and I think, but they were covered in the glory. So the glory clothed them. So can you imagine that you just, everywhere you go, the glory is just following you? I mean, you're carrying this, this cloak of glory, clothed in glory, that everywhere you go, all of a sudden, if there's chaos, the chaos gets lined up and gets back in order? That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. He said, I'm leaving the comforter with you, the Holy Spirit, because greater things, he said, you'll be able to walk in this glory as I had originally intended for Adam to walk in. You don't have to wait to go to heaven to operate at this level, to live at this level. He said, I am placing you here for such a time as this to put things back in order. But in order, only way you're going to put things back in order is that you've got to be covered and walking in the glory. Glory to God. So God took the man, he sent him down the garden to work it and to keep it in order. God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat from it. The moment you eat from it, you're dead. And the Holy Spirit said this to me just as I was, when I was meditating on this this afternoon. He says, you will get an expiration date. He said, I'll put an expiration date on you. It was never intended, but if you go against my commandment. Now, understanding, there was really nothing wrong with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because if there was really something wrong with it, then God wouldn't have put it in the garden. But the reason why God put it in the garden is because he needed man to make a choice. He didn't need more angels. He needed more sons and daughters. That's what he wanted. He was craving the, the return relationship that man could choose to love him as, as he has chose to love us. It's one thing to be an angel that you're there and that's what you do. But to be a mankind and be human, that means that we have a choice. He put a will in us. He put a mind in us. He put a heart in us. And so that we can choose to love him. And if we choose to love him, in return, we get his love towards us. And so when he put the tree there, it had nothing to do with it was a bad tree. It had everything to do with will and choice. And Satan knew that because if Satan could bring chaos, come on, into mankind, then he could put an expiration date on mankind. And if he could put an expiration date on mankind, then he can get that which God created and he can take it to hell to his kingdom. 
So you understand, it's not personal. Every time somebody dies and goes to hell without Jesus, it's not personal. It's that he's trying to take that which belonged to God. And every time that happens, he says, ha, ha, God. But every time somebody gets born again, come on, then we can in turn say, ha, ha, devil. Woo, glory to God. I say, glory to God. Hallelujah. And so when this happened, and so you understand, he says, if you do this, then you're going to die. In other words, you're going to get an expiration date. And so the enemy heard that. Satan heard that. And so it goes on, and go, go with me to Genesis chapter 3. So in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, the serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman. He says, do I understand that God told you? Now, watch how he works and manipulates words. He said, do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? Now, he knows good and well that God did not tell them to eat, from, that they couldn't eat anything. It's, you know, can you imagine how many thousands of trees are in the garden and there's just one tree? You mean to tell me? There, there was other fruit trees in the garden. God wasn't holding anything back. He wasn't trying to keep anything from mankind. But this is how the enemy works. Oh, it's okay to drink a little bit. It's okay to smoke a little bit. It ain't going to hurt you. It ain't going to keep you from heaven. It may not keep you out of heaven, but it sure is going to keep you out of the promises and the blessings of the Lord. Mm. it'll keep you out of the glory because the Bible says in the last days even the very elect of God will be deceived and we're seeing it we're seeing it with everything that is going on in this world the whole point is is that the enemy is trying to keep you from the glory because he knows that once you ever get there then you can check out anytime you want and then he has no more longer authority over you. He has no grip on you because he can't penetrate the glory. And so he said, don't, don't I understand? He said, do I understand? Did I hear this right? That God told you that you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? So you understand what he's trying to do here? He's trying to, to strike up a conversation. See, because if he can get you talking to him, then you'll start listening to him. I said, if the enemy can get you start talking to him, huh? Start justifying. Oh. Then you'll start listening in return. And then all of a sudden, those words become conversation. And all of a sudden, those conversations become death. And so he said, the woman said to the serpent, no, no, not all, not all trees. Now, all of a sudden, now he's got her speaking to him. So what he's done is he's got her acknowledging him. So now he's befriending her. Oh. Huh? So he's striking up a relationship with her. See, he's slick like that. That's the way the world is. The world will try to, to, to get you to, into a, a, just a, a, a relationship. It starts out just real simple. It starts out at a conversation. Now with the world and computers and stuff, it just starts out as an anonymous conversation with someone on the computer. Next thing you know, you're, changing, you're exchanging pictures. Next thing you know, you're having a relationship when you're supposed to be in another relationship. See, Eve was in a relationship, come on, with God. But the enemy was trying to, if he can get her to leave that relationship and start having a relationship with him because he knows he can't, she can't have a relationship with him and have a relationship with God. And so she, he gets her talking, and that's how the enemy works. And she said, no, not at all. We can eat from any, any of the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. Now, here this is coming out of her mouth. You understand? Because what God, evidently God told her, he said, not only do I not want you to partake of the tree, he said, I don't even want you anywhere near it. 
He says, stay far away from it so that you can't even see the tree. He says, there's plenty of other places that you can go. I don't even want that to become a temptation to you. Because, see, God knew that that temptation had a voice. Huh? I said that temptation had a voice, and the whole reason for the voice is, is to keep you out of the glory, to take the glory away from you. Because, see, Satan knows that he can't do anything in the situation. As long as they're clothed in the glory, and as long as they're staying in the glory, then Satan can't do anything. He has no control, no authority. But if he can strike up a relationship, sooner or later, he can get her to lay the glory down and come over there where he's at. And so all of a sudden, they strike up this conversation. And he, she said that, you know, we, can, we can't eat any tree in the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat it from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you won't die? Now he's going against God's word. So he's contradicting. He's contradicting what God told them. And the only way that that, here it is, he's altering the reality of truth. And the only way that's going to become truth in her life is she continues in this relationship. So at this moment, she's got a choice to make. And I know none of you have been at that place or at that moment, at that line, where either you, if you cross that line, you know you've gone too far. Huh? And so she's at that point where it's getting ready to become very dangerous for her, but not just for her. Remember, I said, it don't just affect you. You're not operating in the glory. It just don't affect you. It affects some people around you. Well, the only one that's around her is, is Adam. So Adam is getting ready to get affected because she's being affected. And not just affected, but infected. And so we see here, so he says, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, now he's speaking for God. Huh? Now, he, now he's all of a sudden, he's decided he's going to be God's spokesperson. Huh? He said, no, 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 no. God knows, God knows for real that the moment you eat from that tree, he goes, you, that's what, what you really is going on is that you'll be just like God. Well, the the problem with that quotation and what Satan was telling them contradicted because she's already like God. So when the devil comes to you and says, oh, you can't be healed and convince you that you got sickness and disease and that, that you can't get out of this situation, it's a contradictory to God's word when you're already healed. That you're never going to come out of that situation when you already are out of that situation once you turn it over to God. It is no longer your responsibility. It is no longer your care. It is no longer your worry. But the devil will come to you again the next day and try to bring, <coughs> excuse me, bring these symptoms on you. Come on. So you can start carrying on a conversation with yourself. And the moment you start carrying on a conversation with yourself, then you'll start carrying on a conversation with him. Because the moment you start carrying on a conversation with your flesh and giving into the flesh, you're giving into the enemy. And the whole point is, is him trying to keep you from the glory. You understand? Because, see, once you enter in that, there's no sickness in the glory. There's no disease in the glory. There's no depression in the glory. There's no financial um, lack in the glory. You understand? So this is what the enemy is trying to do. If he can get you in this, and so he can get you struggling life, and what you're doing is you're actually taking your eyes off the word, taking your eyes off God, and you're putting your eyes on the situation, the natural thing. In other words, you're actually listening and giving ear to the voice of the enemy. It's like I told you uh, yesterday, I don't know if it was yesterday morning or last night, that uh, when I got un- under attack with the enemy, and he tried to tell me, you know, um, I think it was night full last uh, after, uh, yeah, and all of a sudden my chest started hurting, you know, and I started coughing. I got started to cough and all this, and I coughed one time, and all of a sudden the enemy comes to you and says, oh, that disease is back. Now, you understand, I got healed from that disease, you know, 40 years ago. Well, how old are you, 35? Well, 33 years ago. 
I got healed of that disease, incurable lung disease, where I was supposed to die at 45. I done been, I already, I've already conquered that. I've already passed that. I'm, I'm going on beyond that. But it doesn't stop the enemy from trying to bring something dead. Huh? Come on. He's trying, listen, he's trying to put an expiration date back on me. But I told him, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? I said, get behind me, Satan. I said, shut your mouth. I said, I've already been healed from that. Huh? I said, I- I'm not dealing with you anymore. Now go away. I'm going to bed. Hmm? Come on now. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. And so you got to have this mentality that when the de- devil shows up, oh, it's just you. Go back to hell where you came from. Huh? Just go back to hell where you came from. That's the mentality that you got to have. And if you take on that mentality, come on now, then you win. So when, the, when, she said, when he said that God knows the moment, listen, the serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment that you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God. When she's already like God. Knowing everything, she already knows everything. Ranging all the way from good to evil. Oh. Notice how he slipped that in. So he said the good, but then at the very end, he slips the evil in. Because now that's one thing you understand. Adam and Eve knew no evil. There was no reason for them to know no evil. Huh? You understand? There's no reason for them to know no evil because there's no evil there. They don't need to know about evil. And so because when you're in the glory... No matter what's out, all the evil that's outside there can't penetrate the glory. So as long as they're covered in the glory, then they don't have to be concerned about that. Amen? And so so it goes on to say, so when the woman saw that the tree looked good, now that tells me, now, see, you understand, this is how it went down, real quickly. My time's almost up. So this is how it goes down. She's walking through the garden. Now, I have no clue where Adam is. I don't know where Adam is. Adam probably should have been by her side, but he won't there. He should have said, no, don't pay attention. Come on, let's go. But he didn't. So all of a sudden, she's walking through the garden. She hears a voice. Now, she has a choice to make. She knows that's a foreign voice because the only voices that she knows is, is God, Jesus, and Adam. She knows three voices. So anything contrary to that, it shouldn't even get her attention. Oh, come on now. Huh? Shouldn't even get her attention. Just like some certain voices should not get your attention. Huh? So she's walking through the garden. God's already told her, don't go nowhere near. So that voice is coming from the, the center of the garden. And she knows God's already told her, don't go nowhere near that. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Don't even go nowhere near that. But yet, somehow, some way, she listens to a small, still voice, and then that voice keeps talking. Now, we don't know how many days, weeks, or years this took place. You understand? Because Satan's in it for the long game. It could have been it could have been a hundred years, it could have been two hundred years. I don't know how long, but before her to start listening to that voice. Because the enemy would go on and he'll nag and nag and nag and nag and nag until you pay attention to him. Come on now. Amen? And so we just can't, let, we can't lend an ear to him. So we don't know how long it took, but we knew it just didn't happen overnight because she's clothed in the glory. You understand? So it takes time for her to peek her head out of the glory. Huh? Huh? Come on. And so as she's walking through, so in a, in a, in, in a period of time, we'll say, all of a sudden, that voice gets louder. And the only way that voice gets louder is that she gets closer. So evidently, she, got, she was curious, and so she just kept getting a little in her daily walks. And I can imagine she's walking through the garden. Well, I'm just going to go this. I'm going to go a little closer today. Because every day, I can imagine that voice. That's the only thing I can say. And so eventually, in over a period of time, she gets close, and she knows. She sees the tree, and she knows because God's already told her not to do that, but she does that. She goes to the tree. First mistake, 
was that she listened. The first thing that's going to get you out of the glory is that you lend an ear, is that you listen to the wrong voice. But the first thing that's going to get you into glory, into the glory, is that you hear the right voice. Amen? And so we see this, and so she, we know the story. So she, she takes it, and she eats it, and she offers it immediately to them. And immediately the two of them, for sake of time, immediately the two of them see what's going, really going on. They saw themselves naked, so you understand. In order for this to happen, now you understand, in order for her to go to the tree, um, Tiffany, Liz, y'all come here for a second. Actually, y'all, y'all stand up here. Y'all remember? <laughs> Don't you love it when kids are... All right, so this represents the glory, all right, okay? So in, order, so in order for me to get past, so I'm actually in the glory, okay? This, on this side is the garden, I mean, is the tree, all right? There's no glory where the tree is, all right? You're not a tree. You're just standing there, okay? All right? You're the wall. You're the glory. You guys are the glory wall, okay? All right? <laughs> All right, so in order for Eve to begin to pay attention, she had to penetrate the glory and lend an ear. Now, you understand, the moment she puts her head through there, the glory doesn't go with her. That's the only way that she can listen. So she's making a choice to leave the glory to listen to what's going on. Huh? And so as time goes on, as time goes on and she's walking through the garden, then all of a sudden, as time goes on, now she's just not putting her head through. Now she's putting her arm through. So she's, the glory's here. So she's having, you understand, she's having to, to leave, unclothe her arm with the glory in order to go this. So eventually, she has to strip herself of the glory so she can't go to this. You understand, Satan can't see her in the glory. He knows she's there somewhere. Satan knows you're there somewhere. But when you're in the glory, he just can't find you. All he can do is holler. So the only thing that he has to offer is a sound. He can't even offer sickness and disease. He can't do anything to you. You understand. All he can offer is a sound. But if you would let's begin to hear him and step out of the glory, then he can begin to carry on a relationship with you, begin to talk to you, carry on this relationship, because the whole point is, is to pull you out. So all of a sudden, she gets so close, then once she puts her arms through, now he's pulling her. The pull is so hard that she don't want to leave. Because now, for the first time in her life, the flesh has a voice. Huh. The flesh, all of a sudden, it begins to speak for the first time. Because, see, in the glory, the flesh has no voice. Oh, come on. That means that you can't, you can't have a conversation with yourself in the glory. The only conversation you can have is with the Father or with Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But the moment you lay out the glory, get out of the glory, and all of a sudden, once you penetrate and go over to this, you literally have to strip yourself just like this right here. I don't know whose coat this is, but I'm borrowing. Oh, it's Liz. Okay, we're good. So it's like this. Okay. It's like a, it's like a new size. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like this. So if she's going to put her arm through like this, then she has to, this, this is how the glory happened. So the glory has to leave because she cannot take this into the flesh. So when she penetrated through this, when she penetrated, so you see, Satan wanted to see her vulnerability through her nakedness. And that's where perversion began to set in. All because she decided to leave the glory, unclothe herself, 
God did not leave them naked. He clothed, clothed them in the glory. Because God is not a perverted God. So he clothed them in the glory. They had a robe of glory on. They, had, they were covered from head to toe in the glory. But the moment she decided to go through and listen to Satan, her, her glory falls. And now, if you know the rest of the story, she all of a sudden now she calls for her husband. And daggone if he, you understand, now he's got to do the same stinking thing. Because all of a sudden, he sees her in a way he's never seen her before. He's never seen the flesh side of Eve. Huh? He's only seen the glory side of Eve. And so it was the flesh side of Eve that convinced Adam to lay his glory down and enter into perversion, into sin, because of a voice. And he had to lay his glory down. And now they have an expiration date. For the first time in history, man has an expiration date. For the first time. And then I, it's interesting because all of a sudden, then they say, they run, they see themselves, and they go and they grab leaves and they cover themselves. Not because of what's there, but because of shame. See, that's what shame does. Shame will want you to try to cover your sin. And shame will think that you can cover your sin and keep it from God. It cannot keep sin from God. Because the moment you leave the glory, then you're opened up. And now all of a sudden the scripture says, and then they hear. Notice this. It never says they see God anymore. It says they hear God walking through the garden. Because you understand, God can't look upon sin. And God calls out to them because he already knows. There's chaos in the garden now. There's chaos because of sin now. There's chaos. He understands the atmosphere is changing in the garden because of those he put in control of the garden has sinned against God. And that's what happens. That's the reason why the earth is in chaos right now is because mankind is sinning against God. And it is our responsibility to take back control and take off the expiration date. Because you know, understand, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the expiration date is lifted. You may take your last breath on this earth, but you really never die. So they said they hear God. Come on, my time is up, and I'll just close with this. So they hear God. They don't see him, but they hear him. And God calls out, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they said, God, don't come. They said, don't come no closer, for we are naked. And he says, who told you? Who told you you were naked? What he was really wanted, what he was really saying is, who stripped you? Who raped you? Because you understand, the glory was stripped, and so they were, they were um, violated. Remember, this is where ver per perversion set in. So they were violated. The enemy violated them. All because they chose to listen to a sound. And when God asked them that, they said, he already knew the answer. And she began to put the blame, but Adam put the blame on her. huh? He said, well, this woman that you have given me, he just threw Eve right under the bus. Wow. You know, it's, <laughs> look, you're the one that gave me this. You're the one that put me under, took my rib, and this is what's the result. <laughs> so what he was saying, he was blaming God. God, it's your fault. You gave me this woman. It's your fault. The reason why we don't, I'm not clothed anymore is because of your fault. Seriously? And then he wants to throw Eve under the bus. Well, you know, it's her fault. No. It was his fault because he was the keeper of the garden. He, could, he, he knew 
When we get to heaven, we're going to know all the answers, but he knew that there was a change coming over Eve. Huh? If he was covering her like he should have, in which we knew he would have, he knew that there was a change coming over. He should have took care of the chaos immediately because he, he had the authority to shut the enemy's mouth. You have that authority if we want the glory. If we want the glory, then the first thing we got to do is shut the enemy's mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your anointing of your Holy Spirit tonight. Mm. Everybody stand to your feet. Oh, Father. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your anointing of your Holy Spirit tonight, Father. You know, there's some things that we need to get right. There's some adjustments that we need to make. For if we want to get to that place, because I believe tomorrow night, oh my gosh. For the Holy Spirit is getting things right in our life tonight. He's getting things put in order so that we can experience the glory of God in this place. For this is what the Lord wanted to do. I wanted to go in a different direction, but the Lord sent me this way. So you got to make a decision tonight. Are you fully persuaded? Are you willing to position yourself so the glory of God can come and overwhelm you and cover you? But you understand, there's no place for sin in the camp. There's no place for junk in the camp. we got to get the sin out. we got to get the things that we're doing that's not right out of our lives. Matter of fact, I'll go as far as to say some, there's, somebody, there's a few people here. Yes, Lord, I see that. That you're in relationship, and I'm not just talking about like a physical relationship, but you're in a relationship with people that you shouldn't be in relationship with. And if you continue down that road in, with these people in your life, they're going to pull you down and they're going to destroy your life, and, and therefore they will make sure that you have an expiration date on your life. Because that's what the enemy is all about. And you know who I'm talking about. You know. Don't let the enemy lie to you anymore. So, Father, tonight I thank you for your word that has been presented in this place tonight. And, Father, thank you that it will not come back void in Jesus' name. But, Father, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon each and every one that is here tonight. That they will not leave here the same way that they came. So, Father, I thank you tonight as we begin to lift up our hands and as we begin to worship the Lord. Father, we begin to get things right right now. We die to self right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.